Rob Reiner is an unabashed Hollywood liberal, an actor and activist who's used very harsh rhetoric about Donald Trump and has assailed the coverage of the president. We sat down here in Washington to talk about that and the new film he directs and stars in, Shock and Awe, about the media's failures, except for one news outlet, in the buildup to the Iraq War. Rob Reiner, welcome. Thanks for having me. You're a fierce critic of President Trump. You hosted a fundraiser for Hillary. I get it. But Robert De Niro goes on the Tony Awards stage and says, F Trump gets yeah. a standing ovation. Yeah. Can you see how that would be offensive to the 45 percent of the country that supports this president? Well, yes. And I can also see how it could be offensive to some of the people who don't support the president. Uh, it, it, yeah, listen, everybody's entitled to, you know, free speech. They can say whatever they want. But I don't think that is particularly helpful for those of us who don't want to see Trump in office and don't want to see him to continue to be in office. Let yeah. me ask you about some of your own words. You tweeted the other day, when an American president uh, attacks our closest allies and embraces a hostile enemy power, you say he's in a conspiracy to commit treason. Now, so because you disagree with Trump's foreign policy, I, I, I which think, you have every right to do. Yeah, I don't. Treason? I don't, yeah, no, I don't. I don't say he is. I said one can only conclude. And there's a big That's difference. That's a fine distinction. It, it is a fine distinction, yeah. but I, I don't know whether or not he committed treason. That will be something that we either discover or don't discover as uh, the invest as Mueller's investigation, because unfortunately, the uh, House and Senate investigations are not uh, uh, are not moving uh, along. So we'll have so to you, see you what happens. You don't see that as an overly inflammatory word to use about a president? Uh, it is a very inflammatory word, but if it turns out to be, let's put it this if, way. Yeah. If it no, turns. no, if. But let's put it this way. From what I see right now, and we have to, there's a lot of blanks that need to be filled in for sure. After the election, you called the outcome the greatest attack on this democracy since 1941. I was kind of stunned by that because you're comparing the lawful election of a candidate who won the Electoral College to the Japanese sneak attack on Pearl Harbor. Now that you're older and wiser, was that going a little too far? Maybe no. you were feeling overwrought at the time? No, actually, I feel a little bit more. I, I think I uh, not only agree with that, but I would go even further because we're not talking about when, when, when we start looking at uh, what happened uh, to America, people have to really understand this. And this is one of the most difficult parts of uh, understanding the Russian... Rob, we had an election. No, 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 I understand that. You're I, comparing it to no, more no, than 2,000 no, Americans no. being killed I'm, at Pearl Harbor. I'm not talking about the election that we have and electing Donald Trump. I'm not talking about that. What I'm talking about, and it's really important to understand this, because this is, this is the key to us here. We're talking about a foreign enemy power influencing an election. In the world of cyber warfare, it is uh, insidious, and we don't necessarily feel it. We do know the capacity. We have learning the capacity, not just from a disinformation campaign or active measures, which the Soviets and the Russians now have been doing it forever. So just to clarify, but your comments are aimed more at Russia and the meddling, the yeah. undeniable meddling in the election. Yes, right, I'm yes, glad we clarified absolutely. that. Absolutely. Let's talk about the press for a moment. You recently lumped in Fox News with Alex Jones and some others in what you call state-run media. Right. I said uh, so, essentially state-run All right. Media. Essentially state-run yeah. media that yeah. backs up the president. I yeah. presume you know the Fox has a thriving news division with Chris Wallace and Brett Baer right. and Shepard Smith and a whole bunch right. of reporters. Right. Um, so I think your label was too broad. Well, I, I do always, and I also tweeted out about Shepard Smith. And uh, by the way, I've met Shepard Smith. He's a great guy. And he is reporting the news. There's no question about it. He is telling the truth. And so is Chris Wallace. And, you know, I haven't seen as much of Brett Baer, but I, I believe he probably is, too. So you disagree and I with do, the And I do know people. there's a difference between yeah. uh, news reporting and uh, opinion and editorial and all of that. But what I'm saying is the editorial part of uh, Fox News, which is, you know, uh, Hannity and uh, Tucker Carlson and um, well, those, Laura, those Laura Ingram, shows, yeah. Yeah. those shows are not just, they're, they're really in support of Trump. And uh, that is, a, Fox News has a good rating. It has a very strong rating. So there is a chunk of media that is in that is verbally and uh, overtly in support of uh, Donald Trump. That's just true. Well, there was a chunk of media that was overtly in support of Barack Obama, including places like MSNBC. But let's turn to the press 
conduct in the run-up to the Iraq war, which is the subject right. of shock and awe. It's right. a period I covered intensively. Right. You're playing John Walcott. He was the Washington bureau chief right. of Knight Ritter newspapers, which right. is now McClatchy, an <laughs> old colleague of mine. In terms of name ID, would you concede that Tom Hanks had an easier time paying Red Bradley than you playing John Walcott? Well, here's here's the funny thing about that. I wasn't supposed to play that part. That that would Alec Baldwin was right. set to play that part, and we had been shooting for a week with uh, Woody Harrelson and Tommy Lee Jones. And on the Saturday before he was supposed to shoot on on Monday, he calls and says he's not doing it. He dropped it. out. He dropped out. I'm saying, oh my God, what do I do? I, so my wife Michelle, who's one of the producers with me, she suggests that I play the part. And I thought, oh my God, I, I don't know. I don't like directing and acting. And then she, I realize I'm playing. I, you know, I said I, I'm available, so I'll do it. <laughs> and then she says to me, the one bit of direction I yeah, got uh -huh. because I'm playing John Walcott. She said, try to be less Jewish. And I thought, <laughs> uh, I don't know, I'm from the Bronx, I'll see what I can do. All but right, well, to, uh, that, was a, that was a work in progress. More now with Rob Reiner as we turn to his new film about the press, the Bush administration, and Iraq. So you say the media weren't tough enough in the run-up to the Iraq war. They, they were not just not tough enough, they were non-existent. Right. Now, there were some exceptions. There were uh, stories of the Washington Post that were skeptical, but tended to get buried on page yeah. A-17. Right. Right. Uh, in one scene, you, playing Walcott, call the Philadelphia Inquirer, the night reader newspaper right. at the time, and you complain they're not running your stories. Right, and that was the case. And what was behind that? Well, that, that actually happened. I mean, Knight Ritter uh, News Service would uh, supply to a number of newspapers around the country, and we talk about it in the film, that they, uh, they were represented by a lot of military bases that got there, and they, you know, there's a speech that, I, that my character gives in the film that he says, we don't write for people who send other people's kids to war. We write for people whose kids get sent to war. And so we were concerned that our, the, the, the Knight Ritter stories were not getting out. And many of the Knight Ritter papers did not print were the Knight Were they not Ritter getting stories. out because... Uh, they didn't print them. Yeah, but even in the broader media, were they not getting a lot of pickup because of the mindset in the mainstream media at the time? I mean, Bob Woodward told me after the war that he was part of the groupthink. Right. Uh, because obviously the Bush administration sold this war very hard. Right, right. The two reasons. One is that we were swept up in patriotism, 9-11, and people just went with, the, like you say, the groupthink. The other thing was the Bush administration, in a smart way and from their standpoint, they never responded to these articles. They gave them no oxygen. Mm -hmm. They didn't refute them. They didn't talk about them. So. It, it never it, it never got any uh, attention. The underlying assumption, and it was more than an assumption in the film, is that the Bush administration was lying about Iraq. Right. Um, but that, as opposed to cherry-picking intelligence, as opposed to not being skeptical enough about the intelligence, but even John Walcott says in an interview that he, to this day he doesn't know that people were lying. That seems like a bit of a stretch on your part. Well, we we're saying that Cheney lied. We say Cheney lied at, that, at, at this one thing about the idea in general, because he had, there were, he talked about a connection between Muhammad Atta and Iraqi intelligence, which didn't exist. He talked about uh, they were on the verge of getting a nuclear weapon. They talked about my, aluminum tubes my point is, that could be used. Saying things that turn out to be untrue, however uh, terrible that is, is not necessarily the same as lying, deliberately peddling falsehoods. Yes, that that that's true. But if you do know that you've already made an assumption that you want to go to war and that you are crafting uh, bits and pieces of intelligence mm -hmm. in order to make that case and ignoring the vast amount of intelligence that says we're not sure about this, we don't have good intelligence because we hadn't been inside Iraq with weapons inspectors for four years, I would argue that you're lying. And at the same time, this president has gotten overwhelmingly negative coverage. He did during the campaign. Everybody acknowledges that. You, it shouldn't fairness be also a part of a message for a fair and independent press? Um, he, he got a lot of negative coverage. There's no question about it. But I don't think in, uh, in the, uh, during the primary uh, uh, season and even during the general, he got the kind of, uh, it, there's one thing to say negative coverage, and there's one thing to say due diligence and scrutiny, real scrutiny. I don't think he got that. You recently had a very civil debate with Anthony Scaramucci. Or are you and yeah. the Mooch going to do some kind of odd couple show? Oh, God. Oh, my God. You know, it's funny. I didn't even know, because I was going to go on the Ari Melber show, you know? 
And uh, they said, well, Scaramucci, I didn't know he was going to be there. But are we going to do a show? You mean like, uh, you know, Crossfire, you know? Yeah. You know, Anthony, you ignorant <laughs> slut. You know, I know, or whatever. You know, we're going to do that? No, I don't think uh, so. I think you're, you're giving it a thumbs down. Yeah, probably not. Rob Ryder, thanks very much for joining us. Thanks for having me. Shock and Awe hits theaters next month and is available now on DirecTV.